Well, this is January 25th, and yeah. we're still in the book of Ephesians. We're just moving along I think, in January. Uh, we got about halfway through chapter 2, yeah. and so we'll pick up where we left off. Uh, we ended up with, well, let me just read these last couple of verses that we finished up with. In verse uh, 8 of chapter 2, it says, for it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, as we've said so many times, salvation is not something we earn. We don't get it by our works. Uh, in fact, salvation is not a reward. It's a gift. There's a big difference between gifts and rewards. Gifts are just something that are given because somebody cares about us, somebody loves us, whereas rewards are what we get because we've earned it, because we work for them. <clears throat> so it's not by our works, uh, so we can't boast, but it ends up with saying we were created to do good works. So again, as we've said so many times, we do good works not to get salvation, but we do good works because we're saved, just out of gratitude for what God's done for us and the fact that that's what we were created for. We weren't created to do evil. We weren't created to do no. things that are harmful to other people. We were no. created to do good works. God's yeah. prepared those in advance for us. And so our goal and purpose in this life is just to find those good works and move in those good works that God has prepared for us ahead of time. And in he equipped us to do. And he's equipped us. Amen. Yeah. Everything that he's called us to do, he's equipped, he's us, equipped to do. us to do. He doesn't call us to do things we're <clears throat> not capable of doing. Now, we may not be capable of doing in our own flesh and our own abilities, yeah. but God gives us the ability to accomplish those good works, to do those things. Many guy. times as you read through the Bible, you see where God's called people to do things that was beyond their capability. I mean, he called Moses to go yeah. and confront Pharaoh and tell him to let his people go. Well, he didn't have the means to do that, but God equipped him. Yes. And God equips us today to do those good works that he's called us to do. Thank you. So, let's go on from there. And Ephesians 2.11. And we'll read a few verses here and then we'll go back and discuss them. Okay. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision... Which here is talking about Jews and Gentiles. Uh, the uncircumcised, those uh, Gentiles, those that call themselves the circumcision, of course, is the Jews. Which is done, and it's talking about the circumcision, This, the, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember, at that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope, and without God in the world, just or but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So he's talking about here, you who are Gentiles, so that would include all of us that are not Jewish by birth. Uh, we were called uncircumcised because we didn't have the covenant with God that the Jews did, which was the mark of that covenant was the circumcision. Yeah. And it says, at that time, we were separated from Christ. We were not citizens of, of Israel. Uh, we were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Of course, the covenant that God made with Moses, with Ab well, started with Abraham and Moses and different people in the Old Testament. Uh, we were not partakers of those covenants. And we were without hope. That's a sad place to be. It is. Without yeah. hope. You know, that's why some people take their own lives because they feel like they have no hope. Without God in the world, you know, to me, that's 
that's a sad place to be too. Now, I know some people say they're perfectly content and they don't have God in their life. They don't even believe in God, but to me, that's a sad place to be without God. And it says, but now, but now, this is the way the situation was before, but now mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus, and again, we hear that expression, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, uh, because when we acknowledge him as our Lord and Savior, we are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. We found out that the blessings come to us because mm -hmm. we are in Christ. The blessings come to Christ, and because we're in him, then we have the blessings of God. Yes. It says, you who were once far away. Well, truthfully, that included all of us, Jews and Gentiles, until the time we came to recognize God, the, the one and only true God, uh, we were far away from God. We were far away from his blessing. We were far away from the benefits that he talks about in, in Psalms 103. He says not to forget all those benefits, and he goes through and lists those. And, of course, the first one is he forgives all of our sins, and he heals all our diseases, and he uh, fills our life with good things yeah. and all all those things that are benefits of, of belonging to God, being in Christ. He says, you that were far away, you've been brought near. Yes. Uh, the word that we see uh, quite often in the New Testament is uh, reconciled. That means brought back together. Uh, two people that have been at odds with each other and have been separated because of things that have happened in their life when they become reconciled mm -hmm. means they've been brought back together. The mm -hmm. enmity between them has been uh, been gotten rid, has been mm -hmm. uh, dealt with. And like, like between Joseph and his brothers. Yes, that's true. Uh -huh. he, they were far away from him or he was far away from yeah. them, but they became reconciled he didn't yeah. hold their sins against mm -hmm. him and they became reconciled became brothers again and and that's what happens when we put our faith in christ mm -hmm. we're reconciled we were far away from god but because of the blood of christ because that blood that he shed on the cross bought uh, our salvation bought our redemption we've been brought near to god and then let's go on, verse 14. For he himself, talking again about Jesus, is our, <coughs> is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed yes. the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body, to reconcile both of them through the cross by wh which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For though through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So he's talking here about <clears throat> the division between Jews and Gentiles. Up until this point, up until the time of Christ, there was a great separation there. And not only uh, spiritually, but physically, you know, in the temple, there was a barrier that kept the Gentiles away from the Jews. The Gentiles could only go in a certain place. Even if they wanted to worship God, they couldn't enter into the place of the Jews. Oh. And even the Jews were, <clears throat> were separated from certain places. Only, only the priests could go into the holy place, and only the high priest could go into the holy of holies. So there were barriers that were set up that kept people divided. But Jesus, him who is our, who is our peace, he's the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's made these two groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, he's made them one and he destroyed the barriers, that dividing wall of hostility. There was a hostility between the, the Jews and the Gentiles. You see that even in the book of Jonah, when God spoke to Jonah and told him to go to sit in Nineveh, said that's a, a wicked city, and said you need to go and preach to them, tell them about God, and and uh, if he said if they don't repent, then I'm going to destroy them. Well, Jonah didn't want to go. What did no. he do? 
He took <laughs> off and went in the opposite direction yeah. <laughs> because he didn't want to preach to the Gentiles. Uh, salvation's only for the Jews. Why should I go and preach to these Gentiles? Of course, we know the story and how he was thrown off the ship and swallowed yeah. by a great whale and finally was oh, thrown up on land and he went to Nineveh and preached and and surprisingly, they listened to what he had to say. They believed him and they all repented. The king called a time of fasting and repentance and they all turned from their evil ways and accepted God and so God spared them. And what Jonah do? I'm surely he rejoiced. Thank God these people were saved. No, no. he got mad. He said, God, why did you save these Gentiles? No. In fact, he said, I knew this was what you were going to do, God. I knew you would save them if they would spare them if you they repented. And so he got mad at God. Oh, I tell you, it doesn't pay to get mad at God. You, no. you know, it's not going to change his mind. His mercy endures forever. But this was the attitude. <laughs> and unfortunately, this, this was never God's thing. That, In fact, the Jews were to be an example to the Gentiles mm -hmm. to show them the mercy and the power yeah. of God. And, and uh, as, the, as Rahab said in, when the, the Jews... Uh, the spy, she hid the spies when they were for, the Jews were first coming in and Israel was first coming into the promised land. She said, we've heard about all the things that God did in, in, in uh, Egypt and all the things he's done in, in your time in the wilderness and our hearts melted with fear. So they, they yeah. saw the power of God. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't turn to him, but uh, that was the purpose of the Jews, not just to separate them. Part of it, of course, was to preserve the, the bloodline for, for the Messiah, for Jesus, but also to, for the Gentiles to see what God, the blessings that comes upon a nation that serves God. And unfortunately, they didn't fulfill their purpose. They began to get exclusive and shut themselves off from the rest of the mm -hmm. world. And unfortunately, we see that happen with a lot of churches today. They shut themselves off. They exclude themselves. They don't, uh, unless you fit into their pattern and, and, and dress and act and talk like them, you're not accepted. But God accepts everybody. Now, he accepts us the way we are, but he doesn't leave us the way we are. He takes us with our filthy rags of sin and he cleans us up. Those that... Uh, he that knew no sin, talking of Jesus, he that knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. He made an, uh, an exchange. Uh, he exchanged our old filthy rags of sin for his beautiful white robes of righteousness. He mm -hmm. takes us the way we are, but then he cleans us up. He changes us. But here he's talking about Breaking down those barriers. God never intended it to be Christians and Jews and different religions, but God is one God, and he's the Messiah of the Jews. He's the Messiah, the Redeemer of the, of the Gentiles. Yes. We're, we're all to serve one God because there is only one God. But unfortunately, man has made all these separations built all these barriers but that was never god's purpose he didn't jesus didn't come to start a new religion no. jesus came to reveal god to the people to the jews and to the gentiles yeah. to reveal what god was really like and to show people how to serve god and what god really expected and of course also to pay the price for our sins he was the sacrificial lamb, as John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And, of course, what was the purpose of the lambs uh, in the Old Testament? The, the sacrifices of the lamb. It was to cover over their sins. Yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they didn't completely do away with sin. They just covered it over for a period of time. But when Jesus came, and it talks about this in Hebrews, it says he made one sacrifice forever mm -hmm. so that sacrifices were not needed anymore the That's sacrifices right. of lambs and goats and yeah. doves and so forth yeah. they, they didn't need to be made anymore because jesus made the ultimate sacrifice and so again 
God, part of the purpose of Jesus coming was to bring reconciliation, not just between sinners and God, but also between Jews and Gentiles to bring us together as, yes. as one, body one body to be together, to have peace. It says he came and he preached peace to you who are far away. And of course, that's talking about the Gentiles and peace to those who were near. And that's talking about the Jews, although many of the Jews were far away too. Jesus talked about the fact that uh, with, with your mouth, you're near to me, but with your heart, you're far away. In other words, they were saying all the right things, but they weren't doing the right things. They weren't believing the right things. And it says, for through him, through Jesus again, mm -hmm. we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access to the Father by one Spirit. There's not one Holy Spirit for the Jews and one Holy Spirit, another Holy Spirit for the Gentiles, but there's one Spirit one. and one Father. Yeah. And we all have access to him through that <laughs> same Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God for that. And I believe the time is coming that we're going to see that reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles. We haven't seen it completely yet. In, in some instances we have. There are a number of Jews that believe that Jesus is the Christ, is, yeah. is their Messiah. Mm -hmm. But I believe there's going to come a time where the, there's going to be a, a mass revival among Jews that they come to that place of realizing that Jesus is their Messiah. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Christians, we should be praying for them, not, not uh, holding them off or, or, or feeling hostility toward them. No. Uh, you know, they're still, in one sense, God's chosen people. Mm -hmm. God made a covenant with them, and he hasn't forgotten that covenant. But today, we actually, we're all God's chosen people. God's chosen yeah. all of us. It just, it's up to us whether or not... We choose to accept that choice of God's. But anyway, that's what he's saying here. He wants to bring us all together. Yes. No separation between us. And verse 19, it goes on and it says, Consequently, you, and of course now he's talking to the Gentiles, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you're fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household yes. and built uh, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a cornerstone. In him let the whole build, in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So, we who were considered foreigners and strangers at one time, us who are Gentiles, have we're no longer that. We're no longer foreigners and strangers, but we're citizens, uh, fellow citizens, along with God's people, which, of course, that's talking about the Jews, the ones that God chose in the Old Testament. We're members of his household, and we're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ himself as a chief cornerstone. Now, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians where it talks about, uh, Paul says that there's only one foundation, and that is Christ Jesus. Um, and, of course, he is the, the foundation. But here it talks about the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, uh, but Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus himself is a chief cornerstone. So it's not changing that. Jesus is still the foundation, but uh, the apostles and the prophets are helping to lay that foundation. And it's all built upon Jesus. He's the chief cornerstone. In those days when most of the buildings were built with blocks, uh, they had what they called a cornerstone. And it was the first stone that was laid. And it had to be perfect. It had to be perfectly level. It had to be perfectly square with the property or with mm -hmm. whatever uh, area they were building in. Because if the cornerstone was a little bit off, tilted one way or the other, or not perfectly level, then the whole building was going to be wrong. Yeah. That cornerstone had to be right. And, of course, Jesus is our cornerstone. That's what we build on. 
That's what we build off yeah. of. We don't look to other people. We don't look to other things or whatever. We look to Jesus. If we keep our focus on him and try to build on him, yes. then we do good. But if we try to build our lives on other people, uh -huh. uh, we're going we're gonna to be in trouble. Because, <laughs> might topple. Yeah, it might topple. Might come out crooked. <laughs> you know, I'm not much of a builder myself, but I built a few things and not gotten the first part of it square. And when you get through, you know, this bookshelf is supposed to look like this. It kind of looked like this a little bit. <laughs> I didn't get it perfectly square. And uh, there again, the thing that you might not notice at first, you know, if it's just a tiny bit off, it's kind of like you know, uh, somebody is traveling a long distance. If you're just one degree off, first 10, 20 miles doesn't make much difference, but the farther you go, the farther off you get. When you go out several hundred miles, you're gonna be way off target. <laughs> and again, that's why we have to make sure that our, our building is built around Jesus yeah. and his example, his teachings, not uh, not man-made teachings, not what people think, but what Jesus said. And the apostles and the prophets, they just built on that foundation. They, they didn't build their own foundation. The foundation was not based on them, but it was based on their teaching about Jesus, yeah. their prophecies and their, their uh, teachings about what Jesus taught. As Paul said, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't follow me when I'm off doing my own thing, but follow me as I'm following Christ. Yeah. And so that's what he's talking about here, laying this foundation. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And what building are you talking about? The temple in Jerusalem? Your church building? No, he's talking about you the temple of the holy ghost the temple of the holy ghost that's us. right we are the temple that's what of the it says holy in first corinthians we are our body is the temple of the holy ghost uh -huh. god doesn't live in buildings anymore i mean sure he inhabits building god's everywhere but you know we sometimes get all concerned about keeping the the the, the our meeting place clean and holy you know oh we shouldn't smoke in the house of god we shouldn't use bad words in the house of God. We shouldn't do this or that in the house of God. We, this is God's place. Well, this is God's place. Yeah. And if we shouldn't do it in that building where we meet, then you shouldn't be doing it in your body. You shouldn't be doing it yourself because that's the building that God is building. Yeah. And of course, uh, it's talking about us individually, but it's also talking about the church, us collectively, because we're all members of Christ's body. We're all members of one body. We're not uh, not separated from the body. So this applies both to us as individuals, but it's also, again, talking about the church. God's building a church. He's building a, a temple, and we're part of that. And in uh, First Peter, I believe, it talks about that we're yeah. what, living stones living being stones. built up, being built up into a building for God. So, mm -hmm. uh, we are a temple in ourselves, but as we join together, we're building a greater temple for God to dwell in. Yes. And like I say, we, uh, we should be a lot more concerned about what we do with these bodies and in these bodies and, than what we do in that building that we meet in. That's just a, a place where you meet on Sundays or Wednesdays or whatever day you happen to meet. Uh, and again, that doesn't mean you don't take care of it, but that's not where God dwells. God dwells in you. And when you go out of that building, God goes with you if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, again, we're being built together. In him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which Christ lives by his spirit. So, like I said, even though we each individually are a temple, we're being built together into a greater temple that God wants to use to show forth his glory. Yeah. That was what he wanted to do with the Jews. He wanted the world to see how great he is, how 
what kind of blessings, what kind of power there is when uh, people get together and serve God, have one purpose. And now he's trying to do that through the church. Unfortunately, we're not to that place yet. There's still divisions. There's still uh, separations between people over doctrines and over things that really don't, uh, don't matter that much. But the thing is, the, the main thing is that we all put our trust in Jesus. If, we, if we're trusting him for our salvation, we're, we're brothers and sisters. Although we may have, like say, different doctrines on the method of baptism or how we take communion or different things like that. Yeah. But the main thing is, are we trusting in Jesus for our salvation? Is he our Lord and Savior? And if he is, then we're all members of the same church. I don't care what name appears over the door of your church or on the sign out front. We're all members of the same church, the same body. We are. Uh, Paul talked about again in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, I believe it is, about there's different parts just as there's different parts to our body, there's different parts yeah. to the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not all eyes, we're not all ears, we're not all noses. No. Uh, we each have our own purpose. But together, as he said, what? how would the body function if we were just an eye? How would we hear? How would we smell? Uh, it, it just, you know, it seems... Uh, a little ridiculous. He goes to kind of extremes to say that, you know, thinking of your whole body being a big eyeball, you know, but uh, sometimes we, we get that feeling, you know, it's all about this part of the body. It's all about that part of the body, but it's all important and you're important to God. Yes. You're a part of that building that he's building. And so we need to keep that in mind. We're a temple ourselves, but we're being built into a greater temple yeah. and we should not be trying to divide and 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 put down other people that maybe believe a little bit different than we do and we do even though our we're we're together in the fact that we believe in jesus yeah. for our salvation uh that's 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 the important thing we're to walk together in unity. In unity, yeah. And where that unity is, the blessing of the Lord is. Sometimes we major on minors <laughs> instead of majoring on the major thing. And what is the major thing? The fact that Jesus, Jesus is, Lord. is Lord. Jesus yeah. paid the price. Yeah, Jesus went sin. to the cross for yeah. our sins. And his blood cleanses us from That's all right. unrighteousness, cleanses us from all sin. That's the major point. That's the oh, yeah. part. That's that's that we agree that's on. it, yeah. It's like say, there's, we can. There's some places in the, some uh, things in scripture, some doctrines. There can be some uh, differences in, like I said, in the method of baptism, the method of taking communion, uh, the the method or the way we do our services on Sunday, all the different things. But those are just minor things. The major thing is the fact that Christ died for our sins right. and he loves us and his, he, his spirit dwells in us and we yes. dwell in him. Yes. And as long as we dwell in him, we'll be fruitful. Mm -hmm. Just as he talked about John 15, if we stay attached to the vine, we're going to be fruitful. But when a branch is cut off from the vine, when we're cut off from Jesus and just we'll wither up and die. So we got to stay attached to him. Yes. But the church is his body. So part of being attached to him, I believe, is being attached to the body of Christ. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, not not being a lone ranger. Some people feel like, oh, I don't need I don't need all these other people. I'll just I can worship God all by myself and do my own thing. And um, I don't think we we can be fruitful that way because Jesus said you're cut off from the vine. Um, you, you're, you're going to wither up and die. And again, even though we might still believe in Jesus, if we're cut off from his body, and he calls us his body, he talks about the church. It says he's the head of the body, which is mm -hmm. his church. Yeah. 
And so when you cut yourself off from the church, I believe you cut yourself off from some of the blessings of God. In Hebrews, it talks about don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some people do. There's an important point there. Yeah. Uh, again, it's, it's not going to church that saves you. You're not um, going to be saved because you're in church every Sunday. But there's, there's something about this fellowship of another believer, being a part of that body. You know, it's kind of hard for a part of your body to function when it's separated from the rest of your yeah. body. You know, if you got a finger cut off, it's not going to do you much good, you know, until it gets reattached to the body. Out there by itself, it's just going to shrivel up and rot. But if it's reattached to the body, as they mm -hmm. can do nowadays, you know, thank God they have ways of doing that now, reattaching some of your body parts that have been uh, cut off for yeah. one reason or another. They can continue to grow and thrive. And, and uh, I, just, I just want to emphasize that today. You know, sometimes we get feeling like, uh, well, you know, especially now with uh, what we, we went through the, couple of years there with uh, COVID, COVID so many yeah. people staying home and, yeah. and a lot of churches yeah. doing online That's services true. which we still do I'm not against those and for those that are, are sick or or for whatever reason disabled and can't make it to church I think those things are good but or if you miss church like I've had a lot of people tell me why well, I missed last Sunday because I was out of town but I watched it on on uh, Facebook or on uh, YouTube or whatever, watched it later on, and so you got to hear what they missed. But for those of you that feel like, well, I don't need to go to church, I can just watch it online, or my favorite preacher's on TV and I just watch him, uh, you're, first of all, you're robbing yourself of a blessing of, of being with other being Christians, with but also you're robbing the body because God gave you a purpose. Mm -hmm. he, he saved you for a purpose. And we just talked about that at the beginning. He created you to do good works. And I realize you can do good works to other people outside of the church, but he also he created you to be a, a blessing to those in the body, mm -hmm. to be used of God. We're to go to church not just to receive, but also to give, to yeah give love, to give encouragement, to give whatever. Uh, you know, I know as being a pastor myself, it's always encouraging when you stand up to preach or to talk to the people. There's a big crowd out there. It's kind of discouraging when you spend a lot of time preparing and you look out there and hardly anybody there. <clears throat> so just your presence is, is an encouragement. Yeah, and uh, it's kind of hard to shake hands through the media that's true yeah you can't shake hands you, and give people a hug, hug somebody yes, through the media through the tv or through yeah. the, uh, through your ipad or whatever you watch it on yeah so again i just encourage you i i feel like that's so important because uh, i i just feel like that's uh that's something that we're missing today yeah. so many people have quit going to church and just feel like, well, I don't need church, and and uh, I can just worship God on my own. And if circumstances put you in that place, sure, you can do that. But if you have the opportunity, I believe God wants you to be part of a body, part of a fellowship, yeah. and, and be a regular uh, presence there to encourage and to help people. Another thing, Joe, is that... Um, the, the communion, when we take communion, it's, it's better to be mm -hmm. all together when we take communion than having to do it by yourself at home, mm -hmm. which you could do, but um, I think it's part of the body's... Yeah. Well, you know, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul talks about the fact that uh, some of you are weak and some of you have uh, gone to sleep because of not discerning the body Discern. properly. Yeah. Uh, I know we can say, well, that's talking about the body of Christ, not understanding what Jesus did for us in his body. But I believe it can also talk about not discerning the importance of the body 
of Jesus today. And again, that's the body. We are the body. Yeah, we and are. And when we don't discern that properly, when we don't understand the importance of the body of Christ here mm -hmm. on earth, uh, I think that can be part of it too. And again, it's... I know sometimes you can't be there because of being sick or being disabled or mm -hmm. whatever or not having transportation, but those are those are rare circumstances. And if you're just staying home because it's more convenient or because you just don't want to take the trouble to go or whatever reason, uh, I believe you're missing out on something. Yeah, that's true. And uh, that's I, I just true. believe there's something in that discerning the body that, is talking about more than the physical body of Jesus uh -huh. when he was here uh -huh. on this earth, but it's talking about the body of Christ today, the church, which is his body. Mm -hmm. It says that many times in the in the by in the New Testament. It says he is the head of the church, which is his body. And so anyway, <laughs> I just encourage you. Go to and, a good uh, church. Yeah, find a find good church. Find yourself a good church. Yeah. And be faithful wherever and you are. pray about it too, you know. Don't, yeah. uh, I hear people that I've heard on Christian stations, you know, say, go to the church of your choice. Well, I kind of disagree with that. I say go to the church of God's choice. Yeah, the you you pray you about it because if you go to the church you choose, uh, you know, things don't go good. I didn't like pastors preaching last <laughs> week, you know. I don't get a lot. Those people that sit over there by me, they're they're too loud or they got a little kid that's disrupting, you know, then pretty soon you find, well, maybe I can go to another church. And uh, if you know that God's put you in a church, then you need to stick with it yeah. through good and bad. It's yeah. To me, it's kind of like a marriage, you know. There are going to be some things you don't like about it. There are going to be some problems and disagreements, but that doesn't mean you chuck the whole you thing. The whole thing yeah. You work through it. Yeah. And if you see problems in the church, then try to be a solution. Don't add to the problem by going around and gossiping about it and telling everybody Ooh. else what a what a <laughs> you know what a bad preacher your pastor is or how they don't do this and they don't do that. Pray about it and do what you can to improve the situation. Yeah. You know the 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 pastor is not the church. He's just the person that God has chosen to help guide it and to teach. Yeah. But each of us is part of the church. That's right. And again, that's so important. And we remember that. We're the church. We talk about, I go to that, uh, to their church over there. No, that's my church. That's part of my, that's part of me, or I'm part of it, rather, I should say. I'm part of that church. Mm -hmm. I'm not just uh, an observer. I'm part of that church. Yeah. I'm a member of that body. And so when I see a problem, it's up to me to pray about it. And if it's something that I can do something about, it then I, I can it. help fix it. Yeah. yeah. But definitely I can pray about it mm -hmm. and not say, well, they don't do things the way I like, so I'm going somewhere else. Because <laughs> truth is, when you go somewhere else, pretty soon you find out they do something there that you don't like. They're no perfect church nope. <clears throat> because they're no perfect people. And as I heard somebody say one time, if you find a perfect church, don't don't go there because you'd mess it up because <laughs> you're not perfect. And truth is, there's not a perfect church. There is no perfect church because uh, the church is a hospital. It's not a place for perfect people to meet. It's a place for people that are getting healed through the power of God. That's right. That's, it's, that's what we go for. Yeah, growing. we're growing. Mature. And we're going to make mistakes. Yeah. Anyway, seems like we've been strumming that tune for a while, but <laughs> but I feel like it's important. <laughs> yeah, we didn't start out with that idea in mind. That's just the way God was leading us. So somebody out there needed that, I believe, maybe more than one person. But anyway, we're glad you tuned in, and hopefully yeah. this uh, you don't get mad at us because we got too far off on that, but. Uh, I feel like that's really important. So we'll continue on next week in the third chapter of, of Ephesians. And uh, we just pray you have a good week. And, yes. And that uh, God just continue Enjoy to bless you. everyday life. Amen. Yes. Well, until next week, then, just God bless you.
And if I can get my remote to turn this off here. Thank you, Jack.